let's let's talk about the people because uh, we'll, we'll try and see what uh, the military is actually what kind of support the military is getting now two ways from the civilian population as well as from the government first with the civilians uh, we we know full well that uh, over time they had to work on intelligence and looks like uh, it paid off knowing full well that even the main informant uh, of uh, uh, Boko Haram has also been apprehended. What do you think happened with the people of those states or those areas uh, to have made them finally, because the other time you talked about uh, soft force soft and power. soft power, <coughs> and that looks like uh, that was what uh, the military finally employed in those areas. Yes, indeed. And other than soft power, you know, initially when the state of emergency was announced, people were looking at the military like an occupation force. It wasn't an occupation force. And other than soft power, the people themselves were beginning to realize that this threat is a common threat, regardless. The threat does not discriminate. So they were all into it. They were the target as well as the soldiers. And one thing was, if you look at the population, you find that the population itself was by far greater than the number of people that were perpetrating this harm, even though they were faceless. So the people came to understand that these people are faceless does not mean they are invisible. They live within us. And the people closed ranks and started to cooperate with the military. And you started seeing even youth who were actually the raw material base of the terrorists. Of the terrorists. Youths were coming out to form groups to assist you call them the group. civilian JTF. The, exactly, the civilian JTF. They were coming out to form groups to assist the military and law enforcement in getting closer to these people. And that is a very effective one because these people live within the local community. They are brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, neighbors to these people. So the best people that can point law enforcement in the right direction are the local populace. So I want to say a big kudos to the civilian populace within those areas for having achieved that. Because some of them died in the process. Yes, indeed, indeed. There will definitely be reprisals, there will be definitely be vengeance missions, but that did not discourage them, that made them stronger. Then for the military, I want to say another well done, but there is still more to be done. The boys have done well, the troops did well. I remembered uh, quite a number of them were pulled out of Mali, where they went and did some very good job. Even though we are still waiting for Mr. President to acknowledge that. <laughs> you know, two sets of Nigerians, two sets of our sons and daughters went to Mali. That was a pretty busy moment for the Nigerian army. Yes. Outside so, and right inside. Yes. You could remember some went to Mali to play as our footballers, and another set went to Mali to fight. And playing and fighting both did well. They left a message and came home. So I'm proud to be a Nigerian for that, for just that. And when the boys who went and played came home, I saw they were treated like befitting sons of Nigeria heroes. I think uh, no less should be done for those who also went there to fight. Do you think the military reinvented themselves? Because, I mean, they won't blow their trumpet. But it, it does come across as though some sort of a different approach, psychological one, winning the people over. That takes a lot. Yes, Especially it does. Especially if they have a wrong perception of you. Yes, it does. And even then, add that to what used to be the old school perception, personal c courage of the soldier. You know, because of the military years, soldiers were actually bullish, <laughs> you know, and people saw them as just that. And we saw what happened in Baga. But then, between Baga and Sambisa, within that short time, we saw an overhaul. We saw a change. I think it's commendable. Within such a short, within such a short while, we saw a virtual disappearance. In All right. Tell us state. about that. You, you were talking at some point about factions. Yes. Because if they were going to elect a leader, the factions that exist there may play up. And that may cause a major impediment because these factions had been there. Indeed. You see, unlike uh, conventional forces, you know, these organizations, terrorist organizations or militant organizations are not as regimented 
as the conventional forces. So you're going to see a situation where, where there is an element of dissent, you see breakouts, you see mm. offshoots. Okay, they may still align on the same motive. They may still have the same agitational causes, but they align with different leaders. And leadership factionalization could even be caused by little things like just ego differences, antagonism. Now, this is an opportunity, as I said, for both sides to avoid going that way and come to you know, the, the center. We can meet at the middle now. It's an opportunity for the committee we're talking about to even hype further the need for them to ground arms. We are not talking about dialogue. We are not talking about dialogue. We are talking about stopping what you are doing first and coming out. There is no harm in appending a face now to a leaderless Boko Haram. Okay? Mm. Coming out to say, okay, that's the end of an era. Going forward, what can we expect? What do we want to see? We can start talking. Okay. Joseph is going to ask you, you know, do you have fears about uh, the civilian JTF? There's this group of youths who, who came and, you know, oftentimes led the military to, you know, certain places where they suspected that Boko Haram suspects could be. Uh, do you fear that after this is done, because uh, yes, it's going to be there for a while, but after the counterinsurgency is done, do you still see a role for them? That exactly is the, is, the, is the issue. Where do we go from here? We have created a group of youths. We have been, already been able to, to benefit from what they have come up with. They've assisted us immensely. They cannot just be left to, to just their, their themselves after this. So I want to believe somebody is thinking about days beyond the status quo. These are men or young men and women who have come out to assist their governments, they shouldn't just be dispersed at the end of it, at the end of it all. There are a lot of people there, that, that you could even talent hunt. Left to me by now, somebody should be looking critically at those of them that will make good soldiers. Of from them, among the civilian beautiful, public? Yes, if they're interested. The tri services, the police, the immigration, you can do a lot of talent hunting there. Okay. The immigrations, for example, should also be looking at those youths because they are locals and they know the ins and outs of that place. Whatever the army has been able to hold and clear of terrorists, you know, presence, the immigration should be able to move in, the police should be able to move in and also occupy. Mm. Speaking about this mm -hmm. uh, cooperation, this joint one. Yes, indeed. What can you tell us about the multinational JTF? Because remember, they set up that the border, Niger also helped in, in, in this fight. What do we expect them to uh, keep doing in terms of what they've done so far? Yes, the multinational JTF are actually, you know, those contiguous states around the areas, they even need to close ranks more now. This more than ever is a time when intelligence and information has to be exchanged on a very timely basis. Very, very timely basis because I assure you, even though uh, Abubakar Muhammad Shekau is dead, the Boko Haram is not dead. It may have created an atmosphere of shock within their ranks. They may have been maybe demoralized for a while. If we don't exploit the window of opportunity, it's going to grow again. You know, as we exploit that, you know, the, the military who had to speak up publicly, especially with uh, its uh, needs. What do you think the government of the day should be doing for the military to further encourage and empower them? Um, presently, I can say, as much as I know, quite a lot is being done. What, what soldiers, officers and men of the armed forces benefit from a democratic governance is quite worlds apart from what was there when there was a military regime. For and real? For real. For real, I tell you.
first and foremost, there's been a reorientation, you know, a reorientation of officers and men to begin to see and subordinate themselves to civil rule. And they are, going, they are, really, they are really blending into it quickly. And uh, the, the service chiefs are also not relenting. If you were listening some days back, the chief virtually admonished some commanders. He wanted to see more involvement. He wanted to see them out there. You see, the military is being encouraged to understand that we are part of a democracy. I'm just quoting now. They are part of a democracy, so there is no isolating them. The democracy must carry them along. Provisions have to be made for their welfare, which I have no doubt are in place. There are issues, there are challenges, but I think with a democratic dispensation, it is open to any person within the armed forces who feels he's not getting enough or feels he's not being treated well to actually have avenues through which to make his grouses known, which did not or were not available some 15 years back or 16 years back. And uh, beyond that, I want to also say for the armed forces, they are doing a good job. We are really proud of them. And uh, we look to see more. And also, 